to get by Benning. Darnell Nurse left it in the corner, gets up center. Perry scoops. Corey Perry. Lilia able to take away from Solani. It's given away to Solani. Around in front. Score! Tamu Solani with the steal. Perry in the face. One left. iced a damn near AHL defensive core, um, you know, close to the Jets. Very interesting game. Very interesting game. <laughs> not the not the one not the way I kind of expected it to go. Honestly, uh, Jets aren't the team that they were last year. Especially now losing uh, Jacob Truba, Tyler Myers, Dustin Bufflin. Uh, I mean, Anthony <clears throat> talked about their um, their blue line on the last show. And how how you know even with the Ducks injuries right now they're probably more depleted than the Ducks are because the first pairing for Winnipeg is uh, Josh Morrissey and Neil Pionk and at least the Ducks can still roll out Cam Fowler even with uh, with uh, Josh Manson and Hampus Lindholm out so it's a tough go for them lately but I guess when you can roll a top line like Kyle Connor uh, Mark Scheifele and Blake Wheeler not you know not all is bad they're still a pretty good team. So a surprising, surprising win. But this is what we kind of expected with the Ducks offense this year, right? Is it's going to be up and down. They have the ability to score seven goals or five goals or six goals in a game. But it's going to be in spurts. It's not going to be consistent. It's going to come in a few games this year. And, and there's no way they're going to get on a roll where it's going to be game after game after game after game that they're averaging you know, three or more goals per game. Yeah, but I mean they are so sloppy defensively. It's unbelievably bad. <laughs> How do we win seven four and all the first things we say in the podcast are negative? It's and it's not negative. I just can't believe how sloppy it was. And the offense was that good tonight, where they were able to get it done with the chances they're able to make. Um let's oh by the way, Shane in there giving me a hard time asking if I'm sober yet. Uh Colorado was not too difficult on me. I'm able to keep up with uh, with Coors Light at uh, Pepsi Center. Um, great game in Colorado, by the way. What a, what a hell of an experience. The game was awesome. Atmosphere was awesome. Clearly, it was, it's always fun with the Ducks win. But uh, pregame notes, Ed, no, like you said, no Lindholm, no Manson, no Kasha, um, no Gooley. Um, he gets sent down to the minors. Odd, because I thought he was injured. They call up Josh Mahura. Um, when you started seeing this all on Twitter, I know that uh, I, I was a nice bundle of negativity as well as I got called out by a uh, you know, friend of uh, us, uh, Sierra. But uh, try to remain positive, Pat. It, it, very difficult at times when I saw the starting lineup pop out. Um, how were they able to move Brendan Gooley down? He's not, is he injured or is he not injured? What's going on? Do you know? One thing I have to say quickly before we move on completely from your trip to Colorado, I don't think the Avalanche are ever going to let you back into Pepsi Center because I believe the moment you went down to Colorado, Rontanen is now week to week with an injury, and Gabe Landeskog <laughs> is out for like three or four months. <laughs> so oh. you left just the, the Avalanche in flames after leaving, uh. go, traveling to and leaving Colorado. Yeah, and week to week is crazy because that that injury on Ranton and we don't need to spend time on it. Looked gnarly. That was yeah. not a good thing for the Avs. Um, so you might not you might not be able to be able to go back. So I, I love back. Colorado, man. I would consider moving there. In fact, I I have been very much considering it. Um, uh, so yeah, as for Brendan Gooley, yes, as yeah, for Brendan Gooley to get back on topic. Uh, I believe as long as he's not on the IR, he's allowed to be sent down. And from what I understand, uh, I mean, Josh Maher has made a pretty good case for himself tonight and staying up with three assists mm -hmm. and, and a beautiful one on Troy Terry's goal that will obviously break down a bit more later. But, yeah, uh, I, I think Gooley was able to get sent down, one, because he's waiver exempt and the Ducks needed to make up a, a roster spot to bring Josh Maher up. Uh, obviously, he is injured at, at some point. I believe he played last game, so I don't know where he got injured or he's still dealing with the injury that caused him to miss a few games before that. Uh, but as long, I think as long as he's not on the IR, he's allowed to to get sent down and, and get called up. And it, I think it's just a paper move. Uh, hopefully he is getting close to returning. 
But uh, like I said, Josh Maher is making it difficult because Hampus Lindholm's hurt right now. Josh Manson's hurt right now. Uh, Brandon Gooley's still kind of hurt, like we saw today. Uh, and if Josh Ma- Josh Maher is going to play like that, then you got to keep him in. He was doing this all last year too. You know, five points in seventeen games last year, and he was making passes like that uh, in, in a horrible down season for the Ducks. So it'd be nice to see what he can do uh, in Dallas Aiken's system, which he should be familiar with from last year. No, hundred percent. I think he looked really good tonight too. Um, but I was very concerned with that the with the with the defense that was rolled out tonight, and they had their moments. But uh, thankfully, uh, they were pretty much carried by the Raquel Henrique and Silverberg line, man. I mean, what a night for those guys. Um, they really turned it on, and so did the kid line. I mean, Steele, Jones, and Terry had their chances too, and you know Terry was able to pot one, as you just mentioned. So um, things slowly came together. They got offensive help from their fourth line down, especially that second period, right? Uh, just a just phenomenal outburst of offense, you know, came to save the day. But um, Gibby already brought up in our chat gets to start it tonight he looked a little off today don't you think not the same gibson we're used to seeing uh it, it, chad in our chat says what do we think is going on with gibby he clearly doesn't look like himself right now think he needs a little rest or do you think the fact that we haven't been scoring goals mm-hmm. until tonight has put pressure on him i think he kind of had an off night a little bit tonight but i mean he's been facing just an onslaught Really? Yeah. Uh, maybe you know, not as sharp. He was he wasn't covering up rebounds and then collect them as as well as he usually does. Um, a lot of people were saying that the goal that well, whose goal is it? Uh, the deflection off Mahura's stick. A lot of people were saying that Gibby should have had that, but that's a tough one because it that was a right knuckle off puck. Mahura's stick and I was a knuckler. You, you really can't do anything on that one. Uh, I guess you could say it wasn't his best game, but he just came off facing 49 shots uh, against the Gold Knights and, and they, you know, limiting them to only five goals in that game when it probably could have been 10 or more the way the Gold Knights were playing in that game. And, and you come into this game too, and he faces another 40 shots uh, uh-huh. and, and makes some beautiful saves to keep the Ducks in, especially late in the game. That toe save on Andrew Kopp is a game saver. So even in a night where John Gibson as a whole maybe isn't playing at the elite caliber we're used to, he's still making important saves to keep the Ducks in it. So you know maybe it's it's a down night from his lofty standards that we're used to, but it's still a well above average night for any goaltender. Well, let's let's roll with uh, some of the plays here, and we got a lot of goals. So I think we should probably stick to the goals to break down. Um, cause there was a, you know, 11 of them, so we can get through them here. But speaking of gifts, so we get to talk about the first, I mean, the ducks had a chance in the first period right off the hop to get a goal. Silverberg breaks into the zone, gets tied up at the last second, isn't able to make a play on the puck. Puck goes the other way. Uh, of course, Ryan gets off falls the neutral zone. Um, which I think created the play for Ehlers to come in off the wall, right? Am I correct? Or is that a different yeah, one? It might've been Ehlers. a different play. No, this yeah. is Nick Ehlers. Yep. It yeah. comes in. And I don't know what you want from Gibson on this one, but uh, that's that's a perfectly placed, pretty shot. I mean, that was it doesn't get any more perfect than that. Gibby's at the top of the crease, a little out. I think he's right on angle. Uh, he's a big dude, and Nikolai Ehlers. I've wanted him on the Ducks for a long time. I mean, why wouldn't you? He's a he's a great player, and he just buried it by Gibson. Yeah, this is I think the first one where I have to get on some people a bit that were saying this one was it was on John Gibson because. I think he did everything he could on this one. He plays the angle. He comes out aggressive. He sees, I think it is Josh, I don't know, I was about to say Josh Manson. I, I think it's uh, Corbinian Holzer or uh, Eric uh, Goodbranson. I used to be able to tell the difference because Goodbranson was wearing 46, so I could see two digits. Now he switched to six. <laughs> and now I can't tell sometimes if it's him or Corbinian Holzer. It's one of them because it's one of the two right handed shots that the Ducks have in the lineup. Uh, he actually plays that pretty well, the defenseman does, trying to block the pass off. Uh, allowing uh, Nick Ehlers and, and John Gibson to kind of have a battle there on a one one on one on the shot, uh, and that's all on uh, Nick Ehlers to make a perfect shot at that point. And, and he really only has one place to put it, and that's where he ends up putting it is is the top left corner over Gibson's shoulder. Nothing, nothing Gibby can do on that one really. I mean, you could sit no. deeper, but then you're giving Nick Ehlers more places to to pick uh, on the net. And yeah, I, I, I love Nick Ehlers. I think we've talked about him on the podcast before. Uh, uh, way back when there was uh, rumors that he was getting traded and that the Ducks might be interested by back when we had Brandon Montour and, and all the rumors that were swirling around that. But, yeah, it, it's a tough start. It's a tough start because it was a, a just under a minute in and uh, first shot on goal for any team and ends up beating it. It ends up being a perfect shot and it beats John Gibson. I mean, now they might be more willing to trade him. They don't have any defensemen. So, yeah. <laughs> 
maybe he will be back on the market. But then again, he's 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 really good. It's it's tough to to let go of a guy like that. Um, let's get to Fowler's goal, man. This was just a great play. I was all started by Fowler. Fowler creates the pass out of the zone. Silverberg drives up, drops it back to Fowler. Fowler just having a you know basically a resurgence, don't you think? And he's yeah. under Dallas Aikens. He's played really well. He's he's got uh, his legs under him this season. He's scoring. He's making great plays. His skating is the best we've ever seen it. I, I really feel like he stepped up his game, and that just shows you what kind of system we had last year compared to this year. A very conducive to a, a Cam Fowler esque player, and he's thriving, man. And he tied the game up there one one. This is a system that is tailored. I, I'm not going to say it's obviously built around Cam Fowler, but it's tailored for him to succeed because it's a high event hockey, which starts from the back end where you have some quick transitions from the defenseman and having the defenseman join the rush. And that's exactly 100% what Cam Fowler's game is. So I think, yeah, he, he's definitely thriving in that new system. This game is pretty, uh, this goal is pretty similar to, to Nick Ayler's goal in the sense that it's kind of from the same position on the ice. It's a left-hand shot. It's a perfect shot over the shoulder uh, of Connor Hellebuck. A little bit farther out. And mm-hmm. I'm not sure who the Ducks forward was that was uh, in a battle with one of the Jets players at the bottom of the circle, but I think that caused a bit of a screen for Hellebuck too, that he couldn't really pick up the puck coming off Fowler's stick. But again, I think even if that wasn't there, that that's just a perfect shot from Cam. And he's got a third of the season already, and mm-hmm. he ends up passing Scotty Niedermeyer for, for sole possession of first on the Ducks' all-time goals uh, list for a defenseman. So... That's how long he's been around already. It, it's insane because um, I, I believe he, he came right out of the draft in his rookie year and played. So he's been around since he was 17 or 18 years old. And, you know, he's already he's already in the record books for the Ducks. And, and you know, when all is said and done, he's going to probably hold most of the records when it comes to points, goals, assists, uh, games played for, for Ducks defensemen in franchise history. Yeah, and you know what though? It's um, it's one of those things you said that he's been coming against his in his since his draft. He's been in the league. You think he's this young baby faced kid still, but I think he's the second oldest. Um, or no, now that we got a bunch of old dudes. At one point, he was one of the leaders on defense and age, and now Back in, he's like the playoffs when when yeah. we were rolling Lindholm, Manson, <laughs> Fowler, Montour, uh, Mahura. No, not Mahura. Uh, Theodore. And uh, Vatnin, he was like one of the the older guys on that pairing on, on that group. He's of guys. 27, almost turning 28. He'd be 28 in December. Um, but yeah, and that was one of the things that uh, Bob Murray mentioned about him. He knows one thing, one regret he had with Cam is that he wished he would have not rushed his his time up in the NHL. And who knows where he would have been? They think, right? You never know. We could have still had the same Cam fellow we have now, which is still a pretty darn or a darn good hockey player. Um, and I don't know why. Why'd you put this gif out of these these uh, these dudes in their costumes? <laughs> well, you missed it. You missed the second jet school. We got. We'll get to that. That's intermission. I just saw that. It made me laugh. I was like, Did you yes. not? You didn't. Oh well, I guess you you might have missed that. But uh, we got to get jet school the game. We, we have get to get to the that. second jet school because no, this, I know. This one, people again were saying this is on John Gibson, and, and I don't I think, know. It's on Gibby. Well, uh, partially, I think at that point. If you're going to put it on John Gibson, he probably shouldn't have made that pass to Larson because Larson's getting pressured from behind, and Mm -hmm. and he obviously can't see the Jets forward coming in and putting the pressure on him. So I think in that sense, that's on on John Gibson. Uh, But if Larson just keeps his eye on the puck and and gets a clean stick on that, he can one-time that pass around the boards, and then that play is completely dead. He ends up missing the pass, and it goes right to... Uh, uh, what's it? Wheeler. Was it Wheeler? Yeah, and, and Wheeler, Wheeler ends up being able to walk in and shovel a backhand past John Gibson. Uh, a tough one because Larson and Holzer have been a, a journey, a struggle for most of the season that they've been put together. Uh, and and uh, Dallas Aikens, he just seems to want to keep them together. And, and I think that's maybe for the sole purpose that the Ducks are, are so uh, weak on the right side. Maybe once Manson comes back. And you've got Manson and Good Branson that you can run. Maybe Corridian Holzer falls out uh-huh. of the lineup at that point because you'll likely see Lindholm, Manson, Gooley, and Fowler, and then either Larson or Mahura and Good Branson. I think at that point we finally get to see that third pairing get shaken up a bit because it it has not looked pretty. I think in almost every game they've played in, uh, they've got just completely caved in and shot attempts, at it, and they've made some glaring errors, especially in this game. In the last game, they've looked significantly weaker than, than any of the other two pairings the Ducks have put out there. 
They've been bad. They've been very bad. And, and you know, they have bad games. Sure, everyone does. They just, like you said, they've been consistently bad. Uh, but you can't blame Gibson on that second goal, really, either. I mean, maybe he could have made a better decision, but Larson's got to have that pass. Yeah. You got to have that pass. You have to get it. You got to be ready for um, that. You know, you absolutely. you know Gibson's behind the net at that point. He's either going to pass it to you or pass it behind the net. He's on his forehand, so there's like a ninety percent chance he's passing it to you or dumping it around the boards. You've got to be ready for that if you're Larson, and, and he just mishandles it. All right, well, let's get to your Halloween costumes because we're two days away from Halloween. <laughs> um, and it's actually one day for you because you're, uh, uh, you know, three hours ahead of us. It's already Thursday or Wednesday for you. Yeah, yeah. It's Don't remind me how early it is here. So uh, what about your uh, – what about your – is this from Blades of Glory? If I, I've never seen that movie. I'm assuming that's what it is. Oh, you're too cool for that movie, huh? I've never seen it, dude. I honestly have never seen it. <laughs> I saw it, I saw it a long time ago, but yeah, it's from Blades of Glory. I, I don't know enough about the movie to quote it, but I just I was just surprised they did it. They said they were going to do it. So it was fan pulled, if I remember. Yeah, it was fan pulled. I think yeah. the other options, uh, I believe they mentioned the broadcast. It was like Goose and Maverick was the one option, and there was a couple other ones. But you, you kind of knew they were going to pick this one, right? They should have <laughs> done Dumb and Dumber. That'd have been great. Yeah, but they they the fans were always going to pick the most ridiculous looking costume, and I, I'm surprised they did it. It was funny. Uh, I give them props for doing that and going on on live TV like that. Oh yeah, so she and they did, had their little intermission thing where they showed them skating around. It, it's ridiculous, but it is very much something that we don't normally expect. So that was fun. Um, how about we get started with the second period and we talk about Ryan Getzloff and how he's going to break his, uh, according to Brian Hayward, his single season goal total that he's had in his what career, which I... Record? 32? I do. Has he broken 30? Yeah, he's broken 30 once. I don't know how I want to say it was 30 34. Yet. I'm going to check right now. You can talk about the goal. I'm going to bring it up. Yeah, so <laughs> this is one you don't normally expect Ryan Getzlaff to, to end up scoring because he gets thrown out of the faceoff dot. Uh, and Maxim Comtois, who at times in the past, I believe in junior, or played center occasionally, but he's primarily a winger, but he goes in and wins as clean as a faceoff as you can win uh, right to Getzlaff, who just uh, throws a floater on net. And I'm not sure if Hellebuck can't see it. it. It is still a pretty hard shot for being a floater, and that's obviously because it's Ryan Getzlaff, and you know, and pretty much any shot he gets off is, is a bullet. And it just finds its way into the top corner over Connor Hellebuck's shoulder. Uh, and Getzlaff has six. He has six goals on the season, which so is So he has insane. 31 was his career high. He's on pace for that. What, what, what this was game fourteen. He's played in every game, mm-hmm. so he's on pace for around 30, 30, 30 plus goals. You know, if he's he's getting pretty close because right now, if if it, five five times their season right now, it's about seventy games. So about at the seventy game mark, if he scored at the same pace, he'd already be at thirty goals. So he's, you think yeah, he's going to make it or no? I, I don't think so. I think he cools down at some point. But I think he can get hit 20. And if he hits 20 this year, that's a that's a pleasant surprise for sure. You know, mm-hmm. 20 goals. And if he hits somewhere around uh, 30, 35, 40 assists and get, can get around 50 to 60 points this year, I think that's a, a pretty good season from Ryan Getzloff. And he's shooting about 16%, which is about 5% higher than his average yeah, right now. So maybe sure. it comes down a little bit. Um, but we'll see. He's shooting more, which is good. Now, I, did you like how the broadcast said that he leads the Ducks in power play goals? I was like... Okay. Does he have two? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Two of their two of their four <laughs> on the four. season. <laughs> it's such a random thing to throw out there for Getz. Yeah. But the the scoring would continue, man. I, I just what the hell? Second periods have always been just a rough patch for Ducks fans and you know for the team itself. But uh, Henrique's able to tip it a shot off a shot pass from Jacob Silverberg. That puts Henrique at eight. Yeah. And there's nothing you could do if you're Connor Hellebuck on this one either. I feel like I feel like. It just was a perfect tip. What are you gonna do? And that would put <laughs> that would put uh, Adam Henrique on pace for like forty five goals this year. Obviously, that, obviously that's not gonna happen. Uh, but just an unreal start for him. Like we're looking at two guys last year who I I believe had, Henry did he clip eclipse twenty last year or did he, did no. he get? No, I, think I don't think Adam had 20 goals. If he got no. 20, it was just around 20. But we've got two guys who either didn't eclipse 20 or just got to it last year that are on he pace had eight to, to, to yeah. shatter that this year. I, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised the way they're scoring now. And obviously, you know, there's plenty of season to be played and guys can cool off. But uh, 
these guys are on pace for around 25, 30 goals this year, and, and I can see them finishing around that base just based off the way they've started. I mean, if Henry gets 10 goals in his first 20 games, I don't think it's a, it's out of a, you know a stretch by any means to say he can easily finish with with at least 20, if not around 30. Which well, you know, he's, he's scoring on uh, one of every four shots, so yeah. he's killing it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the shooting percentage isn't sustainable. We all know that, but. Uh, this is what the Ducks needed this year was guys yes. who didn't step up last year to score more goals this year. Silverberg is scoring goals. You know, Raquel has cooled off a little bit, but you know he's going to get back there. Maxime Comtois started putting the puck in the back of the net. Troy Terry is. Carter Rowney had two tonight. Like, this is what you need from the Ducks. And like I said, they're not always going to score seven, but the way the Ducks are going to win games this year, the way they're going to make get a playoff spot, is getting goals from all over the lineup. Yeah, and you know what? I will agree with the broadcast on this one. They they brought up, I think it was Hayward. He said he thinks this is probably one of the most important stretches of hockey for Anaheim. They got yep. seven games at home. This is massive. That, you, that's you a massive like, stretch. I, I like the old sayings. You, you can't win a playoff spot in October, November, but you can definitely lose a playoff spot in October and November. Mm-hmm. Uh, You're you banking go, points away at this point. Yeah, if you go on the seven-game homestand and you don't win at least four or get points in at least five or six of these games, that puts you in a bad spot at the end of the year where you're fighting with some of these teams for playoff spots. The Ducks could presumably be fighting with the Winnipeg Jets for a wild card spot at the end of the year, the way the the Jets' blue line has completely been decimated this year. like That's a, a very real possibility for both teams to be mm-hmm. fighting for, for those spots at the end of the year. And the Ducks just picked up uh, two points, or I guess you could say this is a four-point game for them. Uh, and that's important. You know, It might not seem like it now, but when you come down to it at the end of the season and you look at the gap in points between the Ducks and the Jets, you're going to come back to this game and, and see how much how, how important it really was. Let's get to the next goal. 42 seconds later, Nikolai Ehlers again gets his second. Um, a lot of standing around and swinging sticks from uh, Corbinian Holzer and Jacob Larson. Not a good look for that defensive pair, as we've already mentioned. Gibby gives up a rebound. And it pops it out to Ehlers, who basically just able to tap it into the far side. This is a defensive breakdown. I, I'm not blaming Gibson on this goal either. No, the no, little sneaks in behind Kubinian Holzer, which is the first problem for the Ducks. I, I guess if, you know in Holzer's defense, uh, you probably don't expect the puck to, to bounce down behind you like that. Sure. And and, and, and have, but he he should know that uh, Brian Little is behind him at that point. And then uh, Jack of Larson gets caught puck watching a bit. Uh, probably just as surprised as Holzer is that Little ends up sneaking behind him, and the rebound goes right to Nick Ehlers, who Larson just completely loses, and, and he ends up getting the rebound past John Gibson. Mm-hmm. A tough one. You know, Gibby's going to want that rebound back, not to say the goal is on him. It's definitely on, on Larson and Holzer in this case. Uh, but I, I think, you know, when he looks back at that, he's going to want to swallow that rebound up and, and not have that uh, bounce right out to Nick Ehlers. But... Yeah, another another adventure from Larson and Holzer in their own zone this year, and, and you know I don't think it's going to be like that too much longer. Hopefully, Josh Manson gets back sooner rather than mm, later. Obviously, he's on the IR, that's so tough. He's probably week to week right now. I know we haven't had a, you know an official announcement, but that's likely what it is uh, for him. At least a week or two at the earliest. So you know we're going to have to deal with it for a little bit longer considering that Goodbranson is the only other right shot defenseman we have right now. But uh, it'll be a welcome addition when he comes back. And, and no offense to Cabrinian Holzer, I, I would love to see him in the lineup at, at some point this season, but it just has not worked with Jakob Larson since the beginning of the year. Not at all. No, I mean, and, and you could look at these goals and blame Gibby however you like, but he still finished the 90% save percentage over the Jets. I think they had 78 or 77, something like that, in the 70s. Yeah. So Gibby, Gibby played better tonight for sure. But yeah, not like him to give up nine goals in two games. This is just not a normal little stretch. But also, he owed almost a hundred shots. Yeah. He faced <laughs> faced eighty nine shots over the last two games. Yeah, and he gave up uh, nine goals. That's not too bad, considering no. you know, and you, you know, it, it's to be expected at that point. So, let's talk about the next one, man. And this was a great play by Josh Mahara. What a beautiful stretch pass over Detroit Terry. Snuck in behind the defense, catching the Jets on a change. Uh, I mean, what a beautiful play from uh, two guys who played together a long time in San Diego uh, to make things happen here now in Anaheim. Uh, just a great play. Terry Terry getting rewarded after a lot of hard work these past couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. the Ducks have really, over the last couple of years, they've transitioned through a few guys who could execute that stretch pass very well. 
like dating back to to Sammy Vatanen before they they ended up trading him to New Jersey. You know, he was always notorious for being able to, to throw that pass off. And you go and look at the the advanced stats behind that. He that was kind of his primary go to pass when you look at the. Uh, what, what types of plays he was making for the Ducks. And then Brandon Montour was starting to throw that into his game too. And I believe the last season before the Ducks traded him, he was the most effective uh, stretch passer on the team. And, and Josh Maher, every time we see him, every time he comes up, he's making those types of plays. And I think some of that comes from the fact that he's pretty comfortable with, with Dallas Akins from playing with him all last year. Mm-hmm. And just from the confidence in his own ability. Uh, I mean, he hasn't exactly lit up the AHL especially this year, but the goals just haven't been that great this year. He looked okay down there last year, but every time he's come up with the Ducks, he's looked like he belonged. Like, five points in 17 games last year for a defenseman is not bad at all. Over a full season, that's 25, 30 points, which is right up there with with the top scorers on the Ducks on the blue line. And and right now, obviously, the season debut, picking up three assists. The the one primary one was the beautiful one on this goal, the stretch pass to Troy Terry. Uh, Mm -hmm. Making plays happen and and, and the transition plays that get him the secondary assists on the other two goals. Uh, Man, he's making it a tough decision to send him back down right now, especially with how bad the goals are. If he's going to be playing like this, it, it's going to be tough. You know, I think they're going to end up having to make a decision between him and Jakob Larson once guys start getting healthy. Again. I mean, if he was a right-handed shot, he's a mainstay on this team right now. Oh, no easily. Matter what. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, he, if he's a right-handed shot, uh, he's he's right in there next game. Kerbinian Holzer drops out. I you know, 100% guarantee that. Uh, the fact he's a lefty kind of makes it a little bit more difficult. I think he's mm-hmm. still earned himself a spot. I really hope that they don't send him back down if Brendan Gooley is healthy. Uh, I think it's easier to, to scratch, you know, Michael Delzato, which they've done already. I think that would probably be the first well, choice. Just I can tell you who they're not going to scratch. Cabranson. He's not going anywhere. No. He's and, making and a to, lot you know, to of be money. Fair, He's here. To be fair, he did not look that bad in this game compared to the Vegas game where he didn't look that great. He was okay. Maybe that's because he switched his number to, to, to six. And now mm. he now he's okay. He was he was living in Yuri Sekatch's shadow uh, <laughs> under the number forty six, and he, he just couldn't handle he's confusing it. Confusing so. you, confusing yeah. you on the replays. Is that him? L- let's talk about elite number one center Derek Grant um, scoring a really odd goal where I felt like he jumped to not let the puck hit his hands and go off his body and in. And he, he I just deserves a bit more credit for the, uh, the I, creativity. I really thought they were the, not going to allow that goal. Yeah, I I, I wasn't sure. I, I it's similar to who he, helmet it was Marchand who in the playoffs where he like headbutted it in. I think I'm not sure. I know that I've seen a goal go off a guy's ass. I've seen it go off a guy's face. Yeah, I mean you I, name I it, think, you see it happen. I know in the playoffs. I think last year, the year before, there was a guy who headbutted it in, or maybe it was against the Ducks. It was Andrew Shaw. It was Andrew Shaw. He headbutted a, oh, a, a they just goal. Oh, put that in chat too. Yep, Lowry yeah. just did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, Andrew <laughs> Shaw headbutted a, a goal in, and that mm-hmm. counted. And and uh, at the time, we I think I think it was against the Ducks. So we were all kind of pissed off. I I, I can't remember correctly, but uh, take some high level thinking at that moment, especially in this case for Derek Grant to not use your hands and to get your hands out of the way and just kind of jump into it and hope it hits you and go in. Uh, you know, we'll never know if that's exactly what he was no. thinking. But, uh, we'll, you know, easily one of the most bizarre goals I think I've ever seen, especially if he meant to do it. The fact that he, he got that much air to begin with, where he jumped to like a good, you know, two or three feet off the ice to hit that in. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised they counted it because it was so close to the hands and you can't exactly tell. But he doesn't make a motion with his hands either to show that he tried to redirect that in, which again, no. is some is some pretty good restraint. From Derek Grant to not have that instinct to kind of push to try to like the blunt the, the bucket, no, yeah. for sure. Yeah, so I mean, great, great goal for him. Uh, one of the, probably one I'll remember at the end of the year for being one of the most bizarre goals we've ever seen. And that wraps up uh, basically the game at that point because you get two more goals in the third period, sure, but uh, that was pretty much the seal on the coffin for the Jets because the next goal in the third period was the one where again people got after John Gibson. You watch this replay. Can you throw this in our on our um, on our Twitch stream? Can you throw this gif of which one of the goal here by um, who scored here? Little on the knuckler. Yeah, because hey, this one. angle is the perfect angle. You can see that puck is like a curveball. That's heading one way, leans back the other. Gibby nearly gets it anyway. 
Um, and it was a, just a bad turnover in the neutral zone. It gets tossed off of Terry's stick along the wall. Puck goes the other way. Along come the Jets. They're flying up the, up the boards. And this puck just gets absolutely redirected. That's some spin on it, too. You see yeah, that, look at that. I, I put it in the, in the Twitch stream so you guys can see. There's some late dip on it that I didn't notice in the beginning. Like right Ooh. before it, uh, right, probably about a foot before it gets to John Gibson's glove, it takes a huge dip down. Yeah. That's a and, tough one. Yeah, I didn't see that to begin with. I saw it knuckling, but that that huge dip right there, there's nothing you can do. He just looks at it. He, you know, when it goes by, he gets a nice piece of it still somehow. Uh, but there is nothing you can do on that. That that's a yeah, that's a, a huge huge drop off. It drops almost a foot down from from its original position where the shot is. There's there's not much you can do on that one. I I, I can kind of you know sympathize with people a little bit uh, in the beginning thinking that was on John Gibson. You know, I, I believe. You know, if you can't see it, if you're at the I game, I did first too. Catching... The broadcast didn't have this view at first. Yeah, they showed yeah, you know, their normal it... side view, and you're like, "Wow, he got beat from a shot from the top of the circle on the glove side." Like, really? Yeah, if you're if you're watching that live and you don't see that deflection, it doesn't look like a necessarily too hard of a shot either, because where it beats him and the and how quickly he gets into the back of the net, it it does look like it's on John Gibson. But watching it now with that dip on it, there, there's nobody saving that with that. Amount no, of that's dip. ridiculous. The, the reaction time you have to have to grab that with uh, the the change of direction less than a foot in front of you that that's almost impossible to save that. Well, let's let's redeem John Gibson here. Do you want? Can you pull up a couple of his saves? I'm making you do this uh, on the fly, which I know you're not happy about. But uh, Gibby's able to get a couple of big saves uh, in the third period that hold the Ducks with their lead. First one comes on Kyle Connor, who the broadcast said had eight shots on goal in the third period as he just gets absolutely robbed here from the high slot. What I mean, Gibby still's got it. Maybe he wasn't like a superhero. He done some that we see him make outstanding saves on. The Ducks let in a ton of shots again tonight, but uh, another outstanding uh, save from Gibson there, and then also on Cop, he makes another one there. But look at this one, dude! Just that glove. What a beautiful save yeah, see, by see John that, Gibson. Dude, we we criticize goalies and think more a little bit more than others on on the shot right into the glove. Being a, you know people say that's a beautiful save when when a goalie just kind of has his glove up and the, and the player shoots it right into the glove. This is this is completely different because the reaction John Gibson makes to adjust his glove to save that he's not. He just in a, stood up too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he just got <laughs> off his post. He's not in a position originally to grab that with the glove, and you see that last second wrist flip to grab that and put that into the glove, and he and he, he gets full control of it too. Like most of mm-hmm. the time, when you see a goalie with that late of a reaction. That's hitting the glove and falling down, or it's getting deflected, you know, either into the net or, or away from the net or over top of it. Uh, the fact that he's able to pull that in and then grab full control of that, uh, it it doesn't look as impressive as it really is. The, the amount of technique it takes to end up actually corralling that save and keeping it close in. No, for sure. And then uh, there's only I think one goal left to talk about, and that is Carter Rowney, empty netter, gets off as. As the broadcast said, unselfish play. I don't think he had a shot at whoa, the empty whoa, net. Are That's we not going to talk about this save? Oh no, I'm getting to it. I got, I got two things I want to get to. Okay, I, I got, okay. I want to go back to those for sure. I want to wrap up the the empty netters. So we could spend a couple uh, seconds. Jones, one I want to talk to you about. But if you want to toss the the other Gibby save, then you can toss the yeah, Gibby I got, save. Yeah, I got. I got another. That one's a game saver because at that point, it, I mean, I think even at the Connor, the Connor, um, at the Connor save, was it uh, five? Four, 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 five, three. What was it at that point? Um, it was five, four. I think I, five, think, four, I think it yeah. was still five, so four. Stop, yeah, so because then are... Carter Rowney gets a breakaway on a Grant stretch pass, and that makes it six, four. Yeah, so I think I think both of these were technically games, especially this one because it was so late in the game. Uh, but that would have made it like, six, five. Score. Yeah, we got what, three or four Ducks players that kind of just don't pick up Andrew Kopp, who's just standing right in the crease. And uh, somehow, I mean, Wheeler at this point, I know it's a six on five because the goalie's pulled. Wheeler is the guy that you kind of leave open behind the net there. That's usually how it goes. But somehow, you know, I think at the, the circle you see, I think it's Silverberg and Good Branson, I believe, just kind of get mixed up. And that's how Andrew Kopp gets left available. And uh, he probably doesn't get everything he'd want on that, but that is a, a ridiculous. It's the top of the save. pad too. It's the top. Yeah, yeah but yeah. it's a ridiculous reaction save for John Gibson. The split second to kind of get that leg out and make that save, and 
that's something we've kind of become accustomed to with John Gibson, and we just talked about it with the glove save and the reaction to be able to flick the wrist up and get that. Same thing here with the pad and being able to get that that toe out there in time to make that save. Uh, the fact that he's able to do that, again, coming off the post for the second time and being able to make that play uh, is just unreal. Now, so Rowney gets a breakaway pass, is able to bury it, um, and then he's also going to be able to hit the empty netter. But I got to talk to you about Max Jones. He didn't score in this game. He did have his chances in this game. If he scores on that little tweeners play he tried to do, he puts the stick between his legs of the puck. Does he just get an endless ream of hell from pundits like in, we've seen in years past? If he tries to do that, because even the broadcast Hayward goes, he got oh ooh. That's a lot. You just try to get a little too cute there. A little too cute on that play. If it's he like, scores oh, on that, no, nobody God. says anything. There's been a of couple guys not. who scored that all year, yeah. But he gets close. I mean, he he's a couple you know, couple inches away from, from scoring that. I, he, he just I, – I don't know much more he could really do himself on that play. I think he was just moving a little bit too fast to pull that off. Uh, he, he gets the stick between his legs pretty much as fast as he can, uh, and he just kind of scrapes it a little bit too late. Uh, but if he gets that, that's it. Like, if he gets full, on the, that side of the net is open. Uh, Bressois kind of bites on that perfectly how you'd want to on a play like that. Uh, and the sad thing is if he scores that, it's still not the best goal of the night. Because if, yeah, if, <laughs> if you haven't seen it yet, Andrei Svechnikov for, scored, the, scored the first lacrosse goal in NHL history tonight. So even if Max Jones pulls that off, it, it, it's not the goal of the night, but it's probably the, the Ducks goal of the season, especially at this point if he, he's able to pull that off. He tries that a lot too. Like he tried that a lot in the rookie tournament. Like I think th- about five or six times he tried that. He, eventually one day he's going to pull it off. This is the closest I think he's ever got in game. Yeah, and Hayward needs to shut up about being too cute because where is he going to go with the puck on his backhand anyway? Right into the chest. Right. Yeah, you could. Uh, the only other option do? he has here is to throw a backhand shot and just hope it squeaks through. Uh, yeah. You know, you can't. You, there's no room for him to cut back uh, to to his forehand because you've got a, a Jets defenseman right there, and you've got Kulikov right behind him too. Like really, the only play he can make is this play right here, and he almost pulls it off. Like he gets very, very close to pulling that off. Would have been nice. Would have been very nice for him to get on the scoreboard there. It didn't happen for him. Poor Max Jones, dude. I want that kid to break through so bad. He's got so many chances, and it's just we've been talking about this now since the end of last season, now into this season. Sure, we're only, you know, what are we, 13, 14 games in right now? Yeah. Yeah, it's he's got to break through. Let's he um eventually let's, let's, like he but he will eventually but we said but I don't I love the guy and I want him to break through but we also said this last year too right That's what I'm saying yeah like so how long are we going to be talking about this before yeah. he finally does it that's the problem that, That's he's, the concern I have is how how long can we say oh he's going to break through until he breaks through There's been players in the past not maybe not for the Ducks but for different teams where the same thing's been said man he's getting his chances just, he's going to break through eventually. It's going to happen. Uh, and then it never happens. And, and I don't, I'm don't. i not saying that's going to be the case for Max Jones. I think he has too much skill for it, for it not to, to figure things out eventually. Uh, but it, that is still kind of a thought in the back of your mind when, you know, you've seen this before with players in the past where, you know, things just didn't materialize in front of the net where they just weren't finishers. I hope that's not the case for Max Jones. I don't think it is because he has been a finisher at other levels before. Uh, and even if he isn't, he still has that those raw tools physically to be, and, and creatively, to be an effective you know bottom six forward. But if he's gonna want to be a top six forward or a top nine forward uh, for the rest of his career, he's, he's gonna have to convert on some of those chances. That one, I think, I think he will eventually. I think yeah, it's eventually that, gonna happen for him. Man. That one, that one, you can't. I, I can't fault him for because that's a hard move to pull off. But some of these other chances we've seen him get this year. If you want to consistently be in the top nine and not be a healthy scratch some of these nights, then you need to start putting the puck in the back of the net. Because we've seen Comtois put up the points now. Troy Terry scoring goals. Sam Steele's playing well. Max Jones is kind of the last guy now of that group that we've criticized since the start of the season Yeah. to really start putting the puck in the back of the net or putting up points. Uh, he needs to do that, I think, if he's going to want to stick around in the lineup. All right, man. So that's the end of the game. Ducks win this one 7-4. to four. Uh, let's tell people what format we're moving to. If you guys are live with us right now, 
uh, we will continue to be live, just not after each game, Ed. Uh, do you want to explain what we have going on uh, in our change of format here coming up very quickly? Yeah, we, we pulled everybody uh, we have on our Patreon and our Discord chat for Patreon, and then we pulled people on Twitter as well. And we've been talking about this for a little bit just because the scheduling, especially for this year, hasn't been great for us getting shows out to you and when we have been able to kind of scrape together some shows the quality of of them prep time of them hasn't been what we'd like to deliver uh, a a great show and and one that we we want you guys to listen to Uh, so we're switching our format to two days a week that we're going to record a show Uh, those two days are going to be Wednesday and Sunday unless there's a Ducks game on that day because we're looking to still go live like Pat said on Twitch and we don't want to go live with the show two hours before a Ducks game. And then all the content we talked about could be completely yeah. old by the time everything happens in that Ducks game. So, for example, if there was a Ducks game on a Sunday, we would record Wednesday and Saturday. If there was a Ducks game on Wednesday, we would record maybe Tuesday and Sunday. You know, we would, We'd let you know when that comes out. But it just allows us to have one more prep time for shows and make sure that the, the show we're putting out is, is a lot better. You know, better quality, and we're better prepared for those shows. And it allows us to do a lot more things like getting guests, which is something that, uh, I mean, I'm sure you guys can understand, but getting guests at this time of night is literally impossible to come on the show. Yep. Uh, most of the, I think almost every guest we had last year was recorded at a separate time and then uploaded as just its complete separate show as, a, as an interview just on its own. So it will be nice for us to get back to what we used to be able to do during the off season, or pretty much all we do in the off season is have guests on our shows live, which will be nice, and that will be something we can do. And it, it's just kind of nice to get on that schedule so that we can make the show as best as we possibly can for you guys. So, And it, it doesn't affect the amount of shows we do for Patreon. If you're listening no. right now and you do, you, you're a Patreon contributor, you still get the bonus shows every month. We're doing a Pucks and Brews tomorrow, a uh, Halloween edition, of course, because it's the day before. Yeah. Um, and if Pucks and Brews tomorrow night. If you think you're going to see us way less often, uh, maybe you want that, but if you think you're going to see us way less, less often, that, that's not the case. Right, right now with the post game shows, we probably do. Uh, well, I mean, it's every game, so it's about twelve to thirteen shows a month. Sometimes in a slower month, it's about ten to ten to eleven, based on the amount of ducks games they have. With this format, uh, we're going to be doing at least eight, if not sometimes nine, depending on how the days fall in a month. So you're still going to see eight to nine shows a month uh, for the regular show. Still live on Twitch, still uploaded yep. to YouTube, so still on still the same. to listen to. Everything's still the same. We're just not live after games, which I think, honestly, probably for a lot of you, uh, it's a lot easier time for you guys to be here uh, instead of you know one forty three a.m. Eastern and what is it now? You're like 11 or ten forty three p.m. Ten forty three now. So, yep. not you know, it will we'll be live a, a lot earlier than that, so you guys can come out and. and then enjoy the game after or enjoy the game the next day and enjoy the podcast so we're we're yeah shane she makes a good point though man about our patreon show pucks and bruise he calls it pucks and water for you then yeah or pop <laughs> or iced tea <laughs> what are you drinking tomorrow on the pucks and bruise show Ed? <laughs> i have no idea i'm at work all day so i have no <laughs> idea what's gonna happen go out on your lunch get a six pack and uh and make sure you have something for our for our patreon people they want it they want to see eddie drink but uh, all right, man. Let's get to a couple of notes. Um, we can definitely answer some questions, and then we'll call it a wrap. But uh, the only notes that I really had for you: um, who was your most impressive player, and then who was your least impressive player tonight for Anaheim? You can go a number of different directions here, and I think I know who you're going to pick for your Golden Boy. But uh, I'm, and I, I bet you I could pick who your, uh, who your, your guy that's in the, uh, in the doghouse too. Hmm. Most most impressive player tonight. That one. That one's tough because I, I liked a lot of guys. Uh, I would have to say, I was most impressed with the play up front uh, of Troy Terry. Uh, but as a, as an overall, if we're looking at the team as a whole, I'd, I'm going with Josh Mahara, just because you know season debut uh, things haven't gone as you would like in San Diego this year. Uh, and he comes up and, and makes a, a noticeable play on the Troy Terry goal. Without that pass, that's not going to be a breakaway for Troy Terry, and that's not a goal for the Anaheim Ducks. Uh, and just his overall play in general. Defensively, that's always kind of been 
an issue for Josh Murray. I don't want to say an issue, but that's kind of been his weak point. Uh, and he looks steady tonight. And then also just getting three assists in general. And, you know, the transition play looked really great for him. Uh, he'd have to be my most impressive guy tonight. Uh, and, and you asked for least impressive or, like, most disappointing? Yeah, that's a tough most one. disappointing. Who's the, who's well, the least impressive player tonight? Right. Well, it's not a five tough on one five. because there's two guys. Uh, and I, I Are you thinking the bottom pair defenders? Yeah, I loop yeah. them in together because <laughs> not, it's not like one guy was worse than the other. Uh, Jakob Larson and Kirby Holzer, I think those were the only two bad spots for the Ducks. And, I mean, Nick Delory, I, I would maybe throw him in there, but I didn't even notice him. I didn't even. I don't think I saw him He once. buried somebody, um, and then that was it. Uh, he made a hit, and, made, yeah. and that's it. And I didn't really maybe, see much of him either. Maybe... Sam Steele, but I don't want to, he wasn't disappointing. He just, he wasn't, I didn't see him that much offensively, but he is a, a great two way player and he played very well defensively tonight, so I can't get on his game too much. I think if you're looking at the only guy, two guys who disappointed tonight, I'd have to say that's Jacob Larson and Cabrini Holzer. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you on that, man. They were noticeably bad, like really, really bad. So, I think Delory had an assist tonight, so. Who? Was he, when? Probably Did it hit off his, hit off his, uh, his shin goals. guard? <laughs> I would have to, yeah. I would, I would think it's one of the Carter Rowney goals. I don't know. I don't remember him getting in his. I know he didn't pass the puck. I don't know. Maybe he lost yeah. the puck. Well, the funny thing it. is you I, I, you noticed Derek Grant and Carter Rowney a ton, uh, but Nick Deloy was on that line, and he just didn't really see him too much, which which still baffles me that Devin Shore is getting scratched over Nick Delorier when oh, Of course he is. When you know Devin Shore, if you put him on that fourth line, you're going to notice him a lot more than you are, uh, but or than you are Nick Delorier, and you're not losing anything, maybe other than a couple big hits a night with Nick Delorier, which isn't really doing much for the team. No. You want to go to Twitter questions, Instagram questions? I don't know if we have it on Facebook. I haven't checked yet. Yeah, you want to go? Let's uh, let's go to Instagram questions. Uh, Yosep uh, DM'd us with a couple questions. So first one he has, he said, is Do you think the Ducks? Do you think that deep down the Ducks have a consistency issue, or are these are these wins and losses just a result of growing pains with a new coach and the rookies? Uh, it's, I'm going to go with it's growing pains. New coach, rookies. Um, they don't have a prolific scorer on this team. Sure, Ricard Raquel's great, but they don't have that it guy like we've talked about so many times. That is just you know, Andre Kasha could be that guy if he was healthy. We think he drives play really well, but yeah, I'm going to go ahead and go with that's what it is. It's it's uh, young, it's a young team, inexperienced. We have a lot of injuries right now too, and it's a new system, new coach. Everything's new. I, I don't think it has um, anything other to do than with that. What about you? Yeah, I, I don't think it's yeah, I I, I don't think it's inconsistency. I think it's still filling out a new system and getting used to it. So I wouldn't call it inconsistency yet. You know, maybe down the road. If that's still happening, then maybe you can call it inconsistency. Um, I, I do think it's, it's more so, like he put in here, it's a result of growing pains and, and yeah. having some injuries and, and having guys come out of the lineup. I, I think their offense is going to be like this all year, you know, injuries or not. I think it's going to have some games where it's like this, where guys are just contributing and you're getting goals from the entire lineup. And there's going to be nights like there was against Vegas where you can't buy a goal or against Calgary where you get beat by a hot goal and, you, and they lose 2-1. to one. That's just how it's going to go this year. They don't have an elite offense. You know, I would argue they don't have a top half of the league offense. I mean, they were the worst so, offense in the league last year. They've, they've got a long way to go. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a work in progress, and honestly, it's already better than last year. You know, you can only go up from last year. And, uh, and the fact that they're having more games like this, I don't, it's not on a consistent basis, but the fact that they've already had three or four games like this in the first 14 games is already an improvement off last year. Mm-hmm. Let's get to a question in chat real quick because it's important. Um, Eddie and Jay have never been there, but uh, highly recommend Tabu Salani's Steakhouse. No, Lowry he's not where we been. checked his new restaurant. He I was, has I'm a new... Getting, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm going to get to that. Okay. Go to his Steakhouse. It's amazing. The burger joint I heard is also really good. It's like a you know it's a uh, it's a fancy burger. It's a fifteen dollar burger. Um, I'm sure they have good beer on tap too. But I'm looking forward to going there next week. I think it's called the Penalty Box, if I remember correctly. Someone correct me in chat if I'm wrong. But uh, hey, yeah, uh, sure. Shane, if you want to go, we should sync up and go, man. Uh, but yeah, I'm definitely going to try that out. Yeah, What's I the- haven't. I've seen it. I have obviously. I have not been. 
for for obvious reasons that I live in Canada. Oh, but... well, just get down here, dude. What, what your <laughs> it, deal the is? Burgers, the burgers look really good. And it's in this, like, <laughs> it, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's in this really cool, like, new development where there's a bunch of restaurants there, a bunch of different things going on there. So it looks pretty cool. He's been making media yeah. rounds, too, Timo Solani. He's been on, like, four different podcasts. He was on TSN today, too. Like, he's he's making the media rounds in Canada. Let's try to hit him up. Let's get him on the show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he's making those types of media rounds. I mean, he might be. You never know, man. He, he's a cool dude. I think if we were able to get hold of him, I think he would come on. But uh, let's see, dude. Let's go to another question in chat just because they're here. Uh, Alchop40 says, will Zegris be that guy? We were just talking about that guy offensively. What do you think about him being, you know, that guy? Is he him? Uh, in, in the, is If he's going to be an elite center? Yeah, it, it all depends on what you term that guy, right? I, I think... I think he can be a first-line center. I think points-wise, I think he can be a 50-, 60-point guy. I think that that's – I don't want to say that's a guarantee, but that based on his skill level, I think that's likely what we're going to see from him. He's got five points in his first five games with Boston University, Boston University which isn't a bad start. He's centering the top line down there, so you're, you're hoping for production in the NCAA this year. Uh, I think, you know, I think there's like probably an 80, 85% chance he's going to be that guy. Uh, and the rest of that, you know, percent being he'll probably be a second line forward. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's any chance he falls any lower than that. I think his skill level is too high for him to bust out than that. I think he has a higher floor than a lot of the, uh, the players. I think the risk in, in drafting him that high was, you know, there's potential he ends up being the third best player in that draft behind Jack Hughes and, and Capo Caco. But there's also potential that offensively uh, when it comes to, you know, goal scoring and, and the defensive side of the game, and then his discipline has just kind of been an issue at times that maybe those hamper him a bit and he just becomes a second line center. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the Ducks right now could really, really use him panning out to his fullest potential and becoming, you know, an 80 or 90 point guy and one of the best playmakers in the league. I think he, he definitely could get there. Uh, and I just I just can't wait to see him in a Ducks uniform. You know, it, it, yeah, it's there's one just thing. no guaranteed ceiling. Yeah, we know it, his floor is higher than most, like you said. Yeah, it's it's one thing seeing him play uh, in, in the U.S. US NT, national development team. It's another thing seeing him play in the NCAA, and it's a whole different animal seeing him eventually play in the NHL against men. You know, I, I like the the step forward he's made with Boston so far this year, uh, but I'm hoping. You know, I don't want his college season to end early, but I hope we get to see you know a couple games uh, with him with the Ducks at the end of the year. Yeah, no, uh, I agree. Let's um, let's get to the question. Uh, you, you said there was another one in there on Instagram. Do you want to grab that one? Yeah, it was another question from Yosef again. Uh, he said, has the ketchup bottle finally started the pour, or do you think tonight was more of a puck luck kind of night? Jeez, oh, that's tough. I'm going to go with puck luck type of a night with a mix of uh, some guys finally starting to break through. I think it's a mix of both. Uh, this team's just not primed to score like this all the time. I don't think we were going to consistently see four goal games, four goal, five goal, seven goal games especially. Yeah, I think we kind of brought this up a little bit already. Uh, I think this year the Ducks are going to have a few games like this every now and then, but consistently it's going to be hard for them to rack up, you know, like a, an eight to ten game stretch where they're scoring over three goals per game. Mm-hmm. I just don't think they have that type of offense yet and, and they, they have the potential to prove me wrong in that in that sense if everybody starts turning it on and the rookies end up all becoming guys who can who can go for for 20 goals this year which is which is a big big stretch to say all of them or even a couple of them could hit 20 goals but you do have some guys who are overperforming like Getzlaff and Adam Henrique who are on pace for like we already said 30 and, and 40 goals respectively so there is potential for it to the catch a bottle to to open in the Ducks offense to get better and become a top a top 15 offense in this league uh, but right now honestly I would take it being you know a tie you know 20 21st 22nd in the league compared to what they were last year and I think that's likely where they'll finish because they'll have games like this where they can put up five six seven goals and they'll have a stretch every now and then which we've already seen where they only score one or two goals a game yeah it just happens you're gonna see it kind of go back and forth um, do you have more on Instagram? You want me to read the one we got on on Twitter? Yeah, go ahead with the one on Twitter, and I'll, I'll grab some more after that. All right, so the one on Twitter 
me bring it up here. I just had it. Of course, I click out, and it's not there. There it is. It's from Phil. He says, is Mahura a better defenseman than Gooley? Mm. I don't think we've seen enough of Josh Mahura to make any sort of commitment on either side of that. I need to see yeah. more NHL Josh Mahura before, right? It, too small of a sample size. Right now, I'm saying Gooley's the better player. Yeah, it's a, it's a little early to to say that Mahur is better than Gooley. I think he's better than Gooley in a couple things, but then I could I could name a couple things that Brandon Gooley is better than, than Josh Mahur. I think Brandon Gooley is a better skater. I think defensively, uh, he's more along in his development when it comes to playing defense at the NHL level. But I think the passing ability, I think that has a slight edge for Josh Mahur, and I think uh, offensive upside probably has a slight edge to Josh Mahura at this point as well just because of, of what you know the history uh, of what he's done in junior and, and the points he's been able to put up but it's close it's close I think uh, you know based on the NHL experience that Brendan Gooley's had and, and, and the fact that he's already played well at the NHL level uh, in a top four pairing with Cam Fowler I think you have to give the slight edge still to Brendan Gooley but uh, Josh Mahura has done nothing but impressed every time he's come up with the Ducks so I think it, it, the gap is definitely closing based off the play from Josh Murray and just the fact that right now Brendan Gooley can't seem to stay healthy. Yeah, that's a problem, man. It's a big problem. It really is. They, they might need to consider just keeping him out long term until we know it's 100% rather than trying to bring him back. I mean, at this point, I mean, we're not trying to go and win a Stanley Cup this season. Yeah, no. Obviously, you want to wait until he's fully healthy and not bring him back too soon. The Ducks don't need to rush anybody back at this point. We've kind of seen the repercussions of that with with what they did with Ryan Kessler and rushing him to back too early earlier on in his career before obviously now the hip surgery and, and the fact that he's probably never going to play again. You can't put that all in the ducks because he was always likely going to have to get that hip surgery. But and that's an extreme case. But you know the ducks aren't in a position right now where they have to do that like they were when they rushed Ryan Kessler back to begin with. So. There's no mm. point right now in and, uh, and rushing Gooley back. Let him get back healthy. Same goes for Hampus Lindholm. Same goes for Josh Manson. You know the Ducks can ride it out with who they have right now, and and you know they can still win games. They they still have great goaltending. They still have the ability, uh, time and you know every now and then to put up these types of games where the offense is going. So they'll still be a 500, if not better, team, and let these guys come back healthy. All right, man, let's do one or two more questions that we should probably wrap up for the night. It's going to be 2 a.m. in your place. So let's get one or two more in before we call it a night. Yeah, I, I think that's all we had from uh, from Instagram. Uh, let me check if we have uh, a couple on Facebook. Uh, we had Nick on Facebook. I uh, said, do you guys think the young forwards should be getting more ice time? They're all between 13 to 15 <sighs> minutes per game. Ah oh, man, I don't know. I think they're playing the right amount at this moment. I, I don't think there's any need to decrease ice time off of Henrik, Silverberg, and um, and Steele or and Steele <laughs> and Raquel. I think the kids are probably getting what they should right now. Aikens likes to roll four lines, and that's what we're going to see. Um, I would definitely like to see if they're going to take minutes away, take away from the fourth line, right, and give maybe give them another minute or two. But uh, I think Akins has done a really good job managing his roster, to be honest with you. Yeah. No, I, I think so. And, and I think right now, uh, I think in general, most of the ice time is down. When you think, you know, Ryan Getzlaff's playing less minutes and, and come to us playing on the top line, I think last year that would have meant he's probably playing 17, 18 minutes a night. And I think right now with Ryan Getzlaff also playing only about 15 minutes a night, that goes for the same for Richie and come to us. Yeah, and he would never be playing on the top line in <laughs> Randy Carlisle's yeah, system. No, it's no, exactly. <laughs> uh, and then you get a line full of kids tonight, which is, I guess you could say, the Ducks' third line, but... It, it you know right now I guess you the, the the top line is probably Henry Raquel Silverberg but it's listed as the second line and Getzlaff and come to on Richie are starting to come on so you could maybe say that's the top line and, and there's arguments for putting Steele Jones and Terry in as as the second best line for the Ducks so that's not a bad problem to have when you don't really uh -huh. know what's your first second and, and third line so uh, I don't mind them playing only 13 to 15 minutes a night because it's not like we're playing. You know, a guy more minutes than them that doesn't deserve it. It's not like Nick Delore is playing 16 minutes a night and Troy Terry is playing 13 minutes a night. It, it's not right. like you're having that type of contrast, and you're also not having 
you know, guys play only seven minutes a night or four minutes a night like you were last year on the fourth line. So I, I think in that in that sense, I think we, they're kind of right at where they should be for this year. And they got to earn the ice. If they start just getting lit on fire here and Terry, Steele, and Jones are, are putting up points every game, you know, in any sort of combination, then you're gonna then they're gonna increase the ice time. You're gonna see them playing closer to probably you know 10 to 11 minutes at five on five and play a bigger piece of the game. But uh, right now, I think it's fine. We got anything else, man, or do you want to uh, call now, this one a wrap? I think we can call it a wrap. The one thing I just want to address is is there – some people saying that there is some inconsistency in, in the, the volume from my mic. Uh, yeah, we, mm. we, we know we've had that issue. Uh, it, it's semi a mic issue and semi an issue with Skype and, and my closeness to the mic. Uh, Pat actually uses the exact same microphone I do. And uh, so there, there's no difference in that sense. We just always kind of had an issue with the volume coming from my mic and my computer. So we're, we're working on it. Uh, there, there seems to be no immediate fix, um, but uh, it, it's an ongoing thing. So, yes, we are aware of it. Yeah, sorry about that. And we'll try to figure out some of those kinks for sure. But, uh, it, it, you know, we appreciate you guys pointing it out and trying to figure yeah, it out with us exactly. too. We're trying to get this going the right way. Anytime, but, if you if you guys notice something like that and something seems off, we, we appreciate you guys letting us know so we can try and fix it. Yep, absolutely, my friend. Well, it's 2 a.m. your time. I'm sure you don't have work tomorrow because, you know, why do Canadians have jobs? They don't. But uh, everyone in chat, thank you guys for coming out and staying late with us. We love the interaction. We love that you guys are coming and listening to uh, the post game show. If you have stayed through and you've popped in and out maybe and you're coming in towards the end of the show and you missed the middle of the show announcement and you missed social media, however, we have one more post-game show left. That'll be Friday night. That's Jason and Eddie on the mics there to wrap up our final post-game show. Um, so further notice, we're moving to a two-show-a-week format, Wednesdays and Sundays, unless there's a Ducks game on those days. Then we'll arrange to make it fit around there. But uh, we want better coverage. Uh, we want to be able to have guests. We want to be able to do more with the show. And we think that uh, basically doing it every post game, the majority of you, we, we polled you guys and listened. You guys listened and uh, answered back. And, you know, most of you guys listened to it after. Um, and this is going to be better for you listening now. Those of you guys who are in our Twitch chat, we're going to be on Twitch. And it's going to be at a better time. And it's not going to be after a game. So you'll be able to do it on an off night. Come and join us. Have a good time. Um, it'll be closer to like 8 o'clock Pacific time. Then, uh, well, you know, 2 a.m. for Ed. So good thing yeah. for uh, for you back east, Ducks fans, or if you're Eddie, you're not staying up till exactly. 2 a.m. doing the show. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and there will be times, too, uh, special occasions where we end up doing a third show in, in that week, uh, more so later in the season when, you know, breaking news becomes a habit. Last year it was a big habit with trades and, and obviously Randy Carlo getting fired, but we had to do a couple of random shows like that. Uh, yep. This gives us more freedom and, and time to actually have a show like that where we're not conflicting with the post game show and, and having to wait a day because we have a post game show tomorrow. So, you know, if, if closer to the trade deadline, there's some more trades that allows us to kind of have, I guess you could call it an emergency podcast where we can do a third show that week and, and get one on there. So it kind of gives us some more flexibility in that. So right now it's set for two, uh, but occasionally you might get a third show. If you're lucky, we might throw yep. a third show in there. So, yeah, we'll definitely, you know, we're going to have them. But yeah. uh, that's it. If you're a Patreon member and you're listening, Pucks and Brews is tomorrow night, probably around 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, join us live on YouTube. It'll be a closed feed, Patreon members only. If you would like to join our Patreon, we'd love to have you. Uh, you can find us at patreon.com slash Um Find out there where you can. we have several different tiers you could contribute to, and we will give back to you in many different ways. And one of those ways is two bonus shows a month. Um, and those are not part of the new two-a-week format. Those are extra. So check us out on Patreon if you want to join the fun. We're going to drink, have a good time on Pucks and Brews tomorrow. We talk hockey and basically anything else that comes up on our uh, on our minds or people listening's minds. They want to send in stuff. We'll talk about that too. But that's it, man. Let's get out of here. Um, Eddie did the uh, Forever Mighty Three Stars update. Go check that out on Twitter if you've been doing in that. You sh- and if you haven't, you should be. Um, and we'll talk to you guys on Friday.